Testing, testing. Testing. Hello, hello, hello. Good morning. I'm so glad that all of you have come to the 28th Holocaust Conference. Thank you. Uh, I would like for you to look at the back of the program. Our sponsors include the Arkansas Holocaust Education Committee, the Jewish Federation of Arkansas, Temple Shalom of Northwest Arkansas, Congregation Itzheim, and the Department of uh, Jewish Studies at the University of Arkansas. So we thank them for making this possible. We have a special event right now. Two representatives from the governor's office have a letter from the governor to us. So this is Chris Fletcher and Stephanie Blevins. The governor sends his greetings and his regrets that he wasn't able to attend today, so he sent us in his place as representatives. So I'd like to express warm welcomes and greetings to you and read this letter that the governor asked us to convey. Loud it? Okay. <laughs> On behalf of the state of Arkansas, I would like to welcome you to the Arkansas Holocaust Education Conference. Holocaust education is vital to understanding the humanity, upholding historical accuracy, and inspiring social compassion. Attendees of today's event will gain new insight as to why and how the Holocaust occurred and its effects that the world still feels today. As you participate in this conference, I encourage each of you to seek out new resources to share with students so that they may understand this devastating time in our history. I commend the members of the Jewish Federation of Arkansas and the Arkansas Holocaust Education Conference for making this important event possible. As governor, I wish you continued success as you educate the people of Arkansas. Sincerely, Governor Asa Hutchinson. At the conference, we have ambassadors from Haas Hall Springdale and Springdale High School. They will be disseminating evaluation forms at each of the sessions, and we are really proud to have them a part of our conference. So they are also going to be making sure that <clears throat> we have the correct number of people per room. So if they tell you that uh, the session is closed, then you have to find another session because we're trying to divide the, the number of attendees so that we have a participation in each of the breakout sessions. So we're very pleased that you're here and I would like to uh, have our ambassador from Haas Hall Springdale to introduce our new spe our speaker. Dr. Dorian Stuper teaches in the English department at Hendricks College, where he specializes in Holocaust literature. He has twice been selected as a participant in the Jack and Anita Hess Faculty Seminar in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. In 2016, Salem Press published his edited collection, Critical Insights, Holocaust Literature, which is designed for students and their teachers. From 2018 through 2021, he was he is the Isabel Peregrine Odyssey Professor at Hendricks College, leading a project entitled Bearing Witness, Holocaust Literature and Education, in which he has trained students to become Holocaust educators. He is delighted to be returning to the Holocaust Education Conference for the third time. Please give a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Dr. Dorian Stuper. Nobody needs to see how many viruses are on my computer. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, and thanks for the introduction. I appreciate that. Can you hear me OK? Check? Yeah? OK. Um, and uh, really happy that my, but my students from this year's uh, part of the project are here today. And I encourage you to, to meet some of them and chat with them um, as we go along. So now I notice that someone has walked away with my talk. 
So somebody who is standing at this podium has taken it, and if they could give it back to me, that would be totally awesome. <laughs> really? I mean, I guess I can just extemporize for a while, but it was sitting right here. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if I have to, but it would be much better than have to. There it is. Well, I, how much is it worth to you? I mean, it's a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that was suspenseful, wasn't it? My goodness. All right. All right. It can clearly only get much, much better from here. All right. Um, so. Okay, in referring to the Holocaust today, I'm going to be using and have in mind the definition that's used by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in D.C., which you will see here at the top of the screen. The Holocaust was the systematic, bureaucratic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. So that's the definition that they offer, and that's the one that I'm going to be uh, using here today. <laughs> so the history that I'm going to be giving you over the next half hour or so is uh, going to be a victim-centered history, okay? The experience of the victims is going to be at the foreground of what I'm going to say. Of course, I'll be talking about the perpetrators and uh, their actions as well. It's inevitable, but I really want to foreground the victims. So who were these victims? The historian Deborah Lipstadt uh, usefully separates victims into two different groups. So she talks about those whom the Nazis persecuted systematically and those whom they persecuted, like, irregularly. Okay? Systematically, in other words, these were groups that the Nazis deemed they wanted to eradicate, if I could use that language, entirely. Right? People who were persecuted regularly were certainly suffered, but there was, no, there was not the same kind of sense of like, uh, all of these people must be eliminated. So you can see here, that, and there are a lot of different kinds of people who the Nazis persecuted. So there are over 20 different victim groups, and I think that's really important to notice. So just some examples here of some of the main groups who are, it might fall into these various different groups persecuted uh, systematically. Of course, the, the largest group here uh, would be the European Jews. Then also the Roma and Sinti people. The Roma people, Sintis are Roma who live in southern Germany and parts of the Czech Republic. Okay. Um, uh, the mentally and physically disabled. Soviet and Polish leadership elites, people like intellectuals, clerics, government officials. The Nazis were very keen to destroy that entire uh, facet of those societies. <coughs> Excuse me. And various ethnic groups in the former Soviet Union. So then on the other hand, as it were, we have those who were persecuted more irregularly. Those could be include p political prisoners, uh, anti-fascist resistors within the Reich, political prisoners from uh, other, uh, uh, anti-fascist resistors from other parts of, of occupied Europe, um, LGBTQ people, particularly German homosexual men, and Jehovah's Witnesses, and also so-called asocials. This was the Nazis kind of catch-all term for people who they, they didn't like, <laughs> who didn't fit in, who, who, be, who they deemed unproductive, okay? So I want to, I'm using Slipstot's distinction here to give you a sense of like, there's a lot of different kinds of victims, and they're not all suffering in exactly the same way, all right? Now, having said that, and uh, another thing, a little point I want to make here is that a lot of people don't know that it's the it's the disabled who are the first victims of the Nazis uh, uh, to 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 be murdered by gas. Right? We we think of this, of course, as a as a crime primarily against Jews, and that's certainly the case. But this is pioneered, as it were, against disabled uh, people in a state-sponsored euthanasia program that was active between 1939 and 1941. Now, as this definition that I have at the top is suggesting. Uh, in the reference here to the murder of six million Jews, Jews are by far the largest victim group, and they are the ones who I'm going to be focusing on today. And most of the sessions that you guys are going to be choosing from are going to have a similar kind of focus. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Jewish Holocaust. We, we are talking about the Holocaust, we're using this term Holocaust all the time today, right? But I do want to say that it, not everybody likes this term, okay? It's a kind of contested term in itself. The etymology of this term, etymology like is the origin of words, history of words, right? Etymologically, this term means burnt offering. And some people object to the connotations of sacrifice 
right, that are implied by this word, right? Sacrifice, martyrdom, etc. okay? It's really important to remember that the victims of the Holocaust didn't sacrifice for some kind of greater goal, right? They were murdered pure and simple. So there is some kind of, there's a, there is some uh, contestation, some disagreement about the word Holocaust, although, as the title of this conference suggests, it's the term that's become most prominently used in the English-speaking world, okay? So there are some other terms that people will use, and I just want to introduce these to you very briefly here. So you'll sometimes hear of the Shoah. This is Hebrew for a catastrophe. The Churban, this is Yiddish for destruction. Yiddish, the language of Eastern European Jews, okay? Uh, the final solution, this is the Nazis' own term, this euphemistic term, and so should be used, you know, like uh, in quotation marks, as it were. And some people don't uh, think that it's important not to refer to the events by name at all and to speak kind of like indirectly, those events, that terrible time, that sort of thing. Certainly, the Holocaust in the English-speaking world has kind of carried the day, used pretty, pretty uh, prominently from the 50s onwards, and especially from the 1970s. There was a TV series in the 1970s called Holocaust that really, that really galvanized the use of that term in uh, America, and that's the one that we'll be using today, but I did want you guys to know about these distinctions in terminology. So the pre-war population of Germany, or uh, the pre-war Jewish population of Europe, I'm sorry, is about nine million people, okay? Nine million people. And the Nazis murdered two-thirds of these people. So it's a really devastating attempt to destroy an entire people, thus a genocide. One mistake that people make sometimes about the Holocaust is to think that it happened primarily in Germany with German Jews as the main victims. In fact, it took place almost entirely outside the boundaries of pre-war Germany, and 97% of its victims were from outside Germany. Okay, this is something that not, people don't always necessarily know. Any ideas about the pre-war, the percentage of the population of 1930s Germany that was Jewish? What percentage of the population of Germany in 1930s was Jewish? Thoughts? Just shout out, uh, shout out your answer. 30%? Half, 50, also half, 40, okay, big numbers. These numbers are way too high, less than 1%, okay? So we're talking about 525,000 people out of about 67 million, right? So I want you to think about this kind of like total mismatch, right, here between like our sense of the, 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 the domination, as it were, of, Jew, of Jews within, the, within this uh, place at this time and the reality, right? Another mistake that people make about the Holocaust is to equate it with Auschwitz in particular and the gas chambers in general. But the Holocaust was a really vast event and it didn't start with Auschwitz. So I want today hopefully gonna give you a little sense of the geographic scope of this event, right? And also the kind of uh, temporal irregularity, if I could put it that way, of it. The Holocaust proceeds through a series of stages, okay? And its end wasn't sort of decided already at the beginning, okay? The, there's a historian called Raoul Hilberg who wrote very famous uh, books about uh, the Holocaust uh, already back in the 1960s. And he has a really, I think, useful description of what he calls three stages of anti-Semitism in Europe, okay? And he talks about how the first stage the, the Gentile population of, of Europe is saying to Jews, you cannot live amongst us as Jews. You cannot live amongst us as Jews. And so the, and the, the, the recourse, if I could put it that way there, is forced conversion. If you're going to live here, then you can't be a Jew, you're going to have to convert. Okay? He's thinking particularly like the Middle Ages, etc. Right? So he, this is the first stage, according to him. You cannot live amongst us as Jews. Over time, this, be, this changes to become, you cannot live among us. And the recourse there is expulsion, forced emigration. You cannot live amongst us as Jews. You cannot live amongst us. Go somewhere else. We don't want you here. To finally, the third stage, you cannot live. This is the, the genocidal kind of stage. So you see that kind of like development here? Yeah? You cannot live amongst us as Jews. You cannot live among us. You cannot live, this intensification. Many centuries of persecution is what Helberg is talking about here, right? Even in the 12 years of Nazi rule that we're focusing on, the forms of persecution changed, even evolved, right? Again, the Holocaust didn't happen at once. It wasn't planned to happen the way that it did from the outset. As I said before, it proceeded through a series 
of stages through this process of this kind of like uh, uh, irregular process of intensification and radicalization. When the Nazis come to power, that's in 1933, what they immediately want to do is to eliminate Jews from civic and intellectual life in Germany. That's their first kind of like goal. So they want to fire people from positions of uh, power, in the, whether that be in the civil service, in universities, in various kinds of institutes, in the police, in journalism, etc. And they did this like very rapidly, you know, in the first weeks, months after uh, coming to power. But they were kind of more cautious, they were cautious at this point about moving to more general sorts of persecution. They really didn't know what people would think both in Germany and in the rest of the world, right? Pretty, it became clear pretty quickly that everybody basically limited themselves to like hand wringing. You know what that means? Like just like, oh, that's such a shame. I wish they wouldn't do that. Tisk tisk, that sort of thing, right? Those were that was the kind of response that they were getting, and that emboldened them, right? If there's not going to be any resistance, then maybe we could or should do more. So that begins this process of intensification of persecution. And a good place to start thinking about that intensification is with the so-called Nuremberg Laws. And these were promulgated in 1935 at a party congress or rally. They would have these big annual rallies in the Nazi party every year in Nuremberg, which is a city in Germany. So the, the Nuremberg Laws are uh, racial laws. <clears throat> I'll try to refer to this slide a few times in the presentation. We've got uh, some of the key terms that I'm, that I'm working with here so you can see how they're spelled, etc. So the Nuremberg Laws are racial laws that defined who, who was an Aryan and who was a Jew. To be considered an Aryan, you needed four German grandparents. So that even if one of your grandparents was Jewish, for example, then you became Jewish yourself, according to the Nazis. So the Nazis sort of made a lot of people into Jews, as it were. People who didn't necessarily think of themselves that way, all of a sudden, as far as the regime is concerned, they are. The Nuremberg Laws pro uh, prohibited intermarriage, that's to say between Jews and, and non-Jews, they prohibited certain kinds of work for Jews. They eventually prohibited where Jews could go, how they could be in public spaces. Eventually, there was a requirement that passports for Jews were stamped with a J. Uh, the wearing of the star, of course, it's so famous. That starts in 1939 in Poland and after um, then became kind of prevalent elsewhere in Europe. If you want to, uh, for a kind of like on the ground viewpoint of what these restrictions were like, it's useful to think about what Anne Frank tells us. I'm sure you're mostly familiar with Anne Frank. Hands up if you know who Anne Frank is. Awesome, okay. So in her diary, right in the first week of getting her diary, in the summer of, uh, of uh, 42, she writes an entry about the anti-Jewish decrees that had followed once Germany conquered Holland in the spring of 1940. Okay. This is what she says here. Jews must wear a yellow star. Jews must hand in their bicycles. Jews are banned from trams and are forbidden to drive. Jews are only allowed to do their shopping between 3 and 5 o'clock and then only in shops which, which bear the placard Jewish shop. The point of this was that by the end of the day, there's just not a lot of food left, right? So it was kind of further kicking the teeth. Jews must be indoors by 8 o'clock and cannot even sit in their own gardens after that hour. Jews are forbidden to visit theaters, cinemas, and other places of entertainment. Jews may not take part in public sports. Swimming baths, tennis courts, hockey fields, and other sport grounds are all prohibited to them. So this place where we are here now, like, no way could they have come here, right? Jews may not visit Christians. Jews must go to Jewish schools and many more restrictions of a similar kind, right? Jews couldn't have pets. They couldn't employ Gentile people to work in their homes as housekeepers if those people were over a certain age. All kinds of stuff like this. The point of these laws was to make life difficult slash miserable for Jews. So in the 1930s, the Nazis really want to force Jews to emigrate. So if you're thinking about Hilberg's stages, it's kind of that second one, right? You cannot live amongst us, uh, so go somewhere else, right? But if you want to go somewhere else, you need some place to go, right? You need someone who's going to take you in. And most of the world didn't want to do that. Not in the 1930s, and, and not at all after 1941. Often you needed some assets, you needed money, right, to start a new life somewhere. And in order to be able to leave, the Nazis would strip people of their assets, right? So they're getting caught in this catch-22 kind of situation. 
I really encourage everyone to visit the United States Holocaust Memorial uh, website. Uh, it is a fantastic website for all kinds of reasons. But in particular, they have a new exhibit there called The Holocaust in American Life, something to that effect. And they have, you can, you know, it's great to go to D.C. to see the show, but if you can't, you can see most of the exhibits online. And it's really useful to see, they have a lot of good kind of interactive multimedia stuff to, so it helps you visualize just how difficult it was for Jews to leave to, uh, uh, the Reich and to come elsewhere. So, for example, in terms of U.S. immigration, there were really strict quotas on immigration, on Jewish immigration to the United States from the mid-1920s on, right? After 1938, Roosevelt... Makes, uh, increases the number of visas eligible. So there's about more than 27,000 uh, visas eligible, available each year. Okay? Um, but it was so hard to be accepted. There was so much bureaucratic hassle, so many restrictions, that in none of the years in the 1930s did they even fill the quota of visas that they had available. Right? And you can see in 1938, 1938, things are getting really bad. People want to leave. So uh, about 19,500 Germans, these are Germans and Austrians at this point, receive visas. There are almost 8,000 visas that go unfilled, right? And there's like 140,000 people who are on the waiting list, okay? So it's really important for all of us to think about, like, you know, whether we're from America, Canada, anywhere really in the world, like, nobody was willing to help, Okay? There was a conference in a place called Evian in France in 1938, what to do with the Jewish situation in Europe, and lots of like sympathetic noises being made and no concrete decisions. Okay? Many Jews did make it out of Germany, but often they would go to neighboring countries, right? which made sense. It was closer to the culture. It was not so far away. But the risk there was that they would either be sent back or that they would become re-victimized when the Nazis conquered more and more of Europe, and that's what happened to the Frank family, for example, right? They get to Holland, they escape Holland in the early 30s, but then comes 1940, and all of a sudden, they are victims of the Nazis yet again. There were various plans that both the Nazis and other governments had sort of vaguely to set up places where Jews could go. There was a plan for a while that they were going to set up a preserve. It was going to be like a, like a theme park, like a zoo, like in, in Poland, the Nishko Preserve, then there was a while there was the idea that, oh, Madagascar, we'll use the island of Madagascar and send all the Jews there. No one asked the people of Madagascar what they thought about that. Uganda, similar idea, okay? None of these plans came to fruition. Palestine, there's not yet a state of Israel, of course. Palestine was a destination, of course, for many, many Jews in Europe. They wanted to go there. But again, the British are ruling the, uh, Palestine at this time, and they have very strict quotas on how many Jews can arrive there. So there's desperate need to leave, but nowhere to go. Does that make sense? That's where you got. Okay. Um, so by 1938, the Nazi response to Jews is really gaining in ferocity. November 9th, 1938, is uh, so-called Kristallnacht. You see there, the not, Kristallnacht, the, the night of broken glass. Uh, on this evening, there's destruction of thousands of uh, Jewish-owned shops. That's the broken glass stuff, smashed shop windows, etc. Right. But also the uh, destruction of many synagogues looting of the synagogues, burning of Torahs, um, many Jews beaten and murdered. So from 1938 onwards, really, the policy of the Nazis begins moving towards the eventual policy of extermination. And who is running this policy? Well, it's the Schutzstaffel, the SS, okay? The Protective Squadron, an organization that started off in the mid-20s as a, a bodyguard unit for uh, Hitler, but became, in the 1930s, probably the most powerful organization in uh, Nazi, uh, in the Nazi Reich, even overtaking the army in importance. The SS was run by a guy named Heinrich Himmler, who you may well have heard of. He himself was a rabid anti-Semite. Among other things, the SS ran the concentration camp system from 1934 onwards, and they eventually were given the primary responsibility of murdering Jews. So they're a really important uh, part of this story. In 1938, Himmler creates this thing called the, he calls the Einsatzgruppen, they all have these terrible euphemisms, the, the death squads, um, who were responsible for mass shootings, especially in Poland in 1939, that's when the war starts, right, the invasion of Poland, um, and then later after the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, in places in Russia like Ukraine especially. So from 39 to, to 1944, <coughs> excuse me, the Einsatzgruppen murdered almost entirely civilians 
The idea initially was that they should be like shooting uh, Jews who were thought to be uh, important in the communist party structure, right? But that quickly changed to like, we'll just shoot all Jews that we find. Um, this was known as the Shoah by bullets, right? The Holocaust, the catastrophe by bullets. Almost two million people are murdered this way. This is a lot, right? It's a really kind of underappreciated part of the story of the Holocaust. People often, most often associate the, uh, the, the death in the Holocaust by, uh, by gassing, right? But about half, almost half of the victims were shot and often in killing sites that were not extermination camps. So people would be taken into the forest near their town, near their village, forced to dig a pit, a mass grave, shot, and then buried by um, locals, who, bystanders who had been kind of suborned. So um, I just want to give you, there are a couple images here that I'm going to give you, and, uh, and these, are, these are difficult images to look at, I warn you now. And um, then a little passage from a text that kind of like is a further explication of this phenomenon. So you can see here, this is from the Ukraine in 1942. And I guess what I really just want to point out here is the, the closeness of this death, right? Like there's nothing detached or distant about what's happening here. Similarly, another famous image here, right? You can see the image is not super clear, but you can see that this is the pit, the mass grave, the body's already there in the bottom. You see this, this gentleman here who is about to uh, have the same fate. Edith Fink, a writer who was born in uh, Poland, the, the place in Poland where she was born is now in the Ukraine. Um, she survived the war by passing herself off as an Aryan and has written a lot of wonderful short stories. She describes one such event, okay? And in this story, a Polish woman is describing to a friend what she saw in the woods. There weren't very many of them, 70 people at most, and a handful of Germans. They took them at night in the outskirts from that neighborhood near the pond. The Germans walked up and down with their guns loaded, and whenever one of them shouted, it was like barking dogs. The Jews were digging trenches. Some of them were already lying on the ground. They dug quietly, seriously, not just any which way. Think about it, digging your own grave. They didn't feel anything anymore. They were dead before they died. The whole process of dehumanization, right, that the Nazis are perpetrating here to make someone a stateless person, a person with no rights, a person who no one has to care for, a person whom, to whom violence can be done with impunity, we really see this reaching its extreme in a situation like that, right? You might not be familiar with Edith Fink, although you all should, she's really awesome, but you might know Elie Wiesel. Has anyone here read Night? A few people have read this, okay, right? You might recall, those of you, the rest of you can just like go to your happy place for a second, but uh, you might recall at the beginning there's this guy named Moisha the Beetle who's this really important figure for Wiesel. He teaches him Kabbalah and stuff like this. He's a friend of his. He's not from the region where in Hungary, right? He's a foreigner, and so a decree comes, foreigners have to go away, right? He is taken, and he comes back miraculously, if you remember this, to tell what happened, and it's exactly this. He was, he was taken to the forest, lined up the edge of, uh, of a big pit, and he happened to be, like, he fell underneath a dead body and, was, was, and survived that way. He comes back to tell everybody in Wiesel's town, and, of course, no one wants to believe him. So this is, again, an example of the, what the Einsatzkommandos were doing in the so-called Shoah by Bullets. So as you could tell from the, image that I sh the images that I showed before, from the perspective of the perpetrators, and again, like, we don't necessarily have to care about that, but the method of de this method of destruction was pretty psychologically brutalizing. In other words, it was hard to shoot people all day long so intimately, okay? And Himmler himself, he's going to visit one of these, one of these executions in Minsk, in, in Belarusia, in, in 1941. And the story is he passes out, he throws up, he, like, he can't handle it, right? So there's this sense of discomfort, if I could put it that way, and plus at the same time, the, the fact that the goal of the Nazis is moving into its final, most deadly phase, right? So not just, the point here now is not just to make life uncomfortable for Jews, the point is not just to kill them as the situation allows, the point now is to kill them all. In January 1942, in a suburb of Berlin called Wannsee, all the top Nazi uh, leaders meet to decide the final fate of the Jews of Europe, and this is where the policy of official extermination is decided upon, the so-called final solution, right, gets its name from that, that meeting. So to this end, in order to be able to do this, and to do it in a way that's not going to like psychologically break all of the officers and stuff in the SS, new technology has to be devised. Okay? So this is where we're moving from the shooting to a different kind of murder, specifically via gas. Right? The first way that this happened was through so-called gas vans. 
and then later the gas chamber and crematoria system. This is to allow murder to happen on a kind of industrial scale, if I could put it this way. And it's no, there's, it's no accident that, by the way, that so many uh, companies, in, industrial companies, some companies that are still around today, Siemens, for example, or Bayer, were really involved in the concentration camp system. There was a real melding of death and industry at this point. The gas vans, they were used in the Baltics, up north, in the Balkans, down south, especially in near Belgrade, and in Poland. These were like, these were just, these were trucks, hermetically sealed at the back. They could hold 20 to 50 people in the back, sealed, and then the exhaust from the truck was run into the back, and then a couple of SS guys get in the front and they just drive around for like 20 or 30 minutes, right? Until everybody in the back is dead. Um, this turned out to be kind of a temporary solution for the Nazis because it was a slow and painful death and the perpetrators, although they didn't have to see what was going on, they certainly heard what was going on and this was upsetting to them. <laughs> um, so again, it becomes like not a solution, right? A real radical solution is needed. And that's the gas uh, chamber and crematoria system that we kind of associate so strongly with the Holocaust. And this really becomes operational in 1941 and 1942. I'm going to say a little bit about that, but before I do that, I think it's important that we know a little bit about how it is that Jews, victims, more generally, got to that place. That was largely through a process of ghettoization. So, already starting in 1939, with the invasion of Poland, Germans had confined Jews to ghettos in cities and towns across Poland, and then later across Eastern Europe. Ghetto is uh, Italian for a foundry, you know, a place like where you like where you make iron because uh, that was a location in Venice a long time ago of this foundry that later became a, a neighborhood where Jews mostly lived. Okay, that's where that that term comes from. So so Jews are living in ghettos across Eastern Europe, and life there is really miserable. It is full of sickness. It is full of hunger. It is full of despair. The average ration that people have in the ghettos is about 800 calories a day. I mean, we probably just ate 800 calories with our bagels a second ago, right? Okay, so we can think about it like that, that kind of disparity. Um, the, the Jews in the ghetto are used as forced labor. The most famous example of this was in the ghetto in Lodz city in Poland, which had been a big textile manufacturing place before the war, and they made all these sweatshops, basically, where Jewish forced labor is making uniforms for the German war effort, okay? I'm gonna show you a couple of images from uh, ghetto life. Here is a photograph from a scene in the Warsaw Ghetto. Again, all the large cities in Poland and lots of places in Eastern Europe had such ghettos. The largest ones were in Poland. I think we get a sense of the difficulty of life there. A couple of very famous images from the Lodz or Wuj, depending on if you're speaking Yiddish or Polish ghetto. Um, these are from a German accountant who was a, who was a photography buff and who took these really interesting color photographs. You can see here a street scene. And here's the image of what I was talking about, the sweatshops, the making, they're making uniforms there. A guy named David Sharkovac, he's like 17 years old, teenager, he's, he's from Lodz, he's, he's imprisoned in the ghetto with his family. He keeps a really remarkable diary, I encourage you all to read it. Just a couple of excerpts, every page of the diary is filled with kind of these, these descriptions of like how difficult life was there. Uh, so the first entry is from July 5th, 1942. There's almost nothing to cook at home. Radish leaves are our essential food. I'm so weakened that I lie all day long as though I were dead. I don't read. I don't want to do anything. Slow death has begun. Sherkovac did not survive the war. He died of typhus, as so many people did. Does he, because all these people were crammed into a very small space and they're all hungry and frightened, disease is really rampant, right? Everyone's immune system is kind of destroyed and, like, and uh, um, disease swept through the, the, the uh, ghettos. Another entry from August 23rd, 1942. Sherkovac writes, I don't know whether it's because of the heat or because of some other reason, but bedbugs and flies have multiplied in our home just as they have everywhere else. We have swarms of them at home. I'm sure the bedbugs drink half a glass of my blood every night. As for the flies, we just can't get away from them. The radical remedy for these plagues would be to end the war. That would solve this and other important problems as well. So you can see how Sherkovac had a, kind of a nice line in irony. Um, his diary is really, really a fascinating thing to read. So the ghettos are happening all across Eastern Europe. In Western Europe, things are a little different, and that's because Jews there tended to be more assimilated. 
That means they were more um, integrated into mainstream life. They were less segregated. So it was harder for Nazis to kind of corral Jews into like one location the way they could more easily do in Eastern Europe. So there, uh, Jews were deported to so-called transit camps. So these would be these camps. There's sort of one in each Western European nation where Jews were being uh, imprisoned. They were held there sometimes days, sometimes weeks, sometimes months before eventually being further deported to the east. Okay? And Frank, for example, famously is a transit camp in Westerbork in Holland before she is deported to Auschwitz and then Bergen-Belsen. The destination of those transports were the camps. And in our everyday language, we talk about concentration camps all the time, right? You're familiar with this term. I want to alert you to the fact that there is a difference in terms of the history of this, of this time between concentration camps and extermination camps. By the way, the Nazis are, do not invent concentration camps. That uh, dubious distinction would go to the British, who first used them in the Boer War in South Africa at the very, very end of the 19th century. Okay? But certainly the Nazis had a, a, their own spin on the concentration camp and made it a very robust part of their, of their society. Um, and they established these camps really, really soon after they took power, like within the first couple of weeks. And at the beginning, these camps were for political prisoners, like mostly communist social de democrats, people who disagreed with the regime more generally, right? And they were kind of like these large-scale prisons, okay? Lots of people died there. There was lots of brutality, punishment, etc. But the point of those concentration camps wasn't to kill everybody, all right? But the extermination camps, where the point was, in fact, just to do that, these are established in the fall of 1941. Again, as I said, because of the limitations of these other forms of murder that we saw before. They're sometimes also known as death camps, death factories. We typically today, scholars call them killing centers. Get a little sense of where, the, where these uh, death camps were here. We're looking at Poland, okay? And they're primarily in the part of Poland that had been taken over by the Germans in 1939 but had not been annexed to the Reich. Specifically, they called it the General Gouvernement. So they set up these uh, camps at uh, Treblinka, at Belgic, at Sobibor. Then they also retrofitted, if I could put it that way, uh, our existing camps in Madonic, which is the city of Lublin, and then, of course, Auschwitz, not too far from Krakow. The, the killing camp that they built at Auschwitz is Birkenau, Auschwitz II, really giant facility. Some of you may be familiar with it, right? They also established one in the, in the, in the Wartegau, in the, this part to become part of the Reich here, at Chelmno. Chelmno was the place, the first place, uh, the first stationary facility where gas was used for the mass extermination of Jews. And so by 1942, these uh, death camps are fully operational. So 42 is a really significant year for understanding the Holocaust. It is probably the darkest year in Jewish history because both the Shoah by bullets that I talked to you guys about, the mass shootings, right, and the Shoah by gas are happening. They're both ongoing. The historian Christopher Browning has, has, uh, has noted that in mid-March 1942, about 75 to 80% of the eventual victims of the Holocaust were still alive. So three quarters of them are still alive in February of 42. By mid-February 1943, so this is not even a year later, right? 11 months later, the percentages are exactly reversed. 25% of the victims are still alive, 75% of them murdered. So this year is kind of like extraordinary in terms of its ferocity and horror. To add to that horror, Jews were forced to process the death of their own people in these camps, especially the so-called Sonderkommando, the special units, the special work details. These were work groups. Everyone who's in a concentration camp and selected for labor was in some kind of work detail or some kind of work group. These special work groups were consist of men whose job, these Jewish uh, prisoners, who were selected by the Nazis to perform a variety of duties in the gas chambers and the crematoria. Specifically, they would ensure that the prisoners undressed when they arrived in the gas chamber, they would then disentangle the bodies after the gassing and take them to the crematoria. They would shave the victim's hair. They would search the bodies for valuables, including gold crowns and fillings. All that money went to the Reich. And finally, they would burn the bodies in the ovens and uh, dispose of the ashes. These people were known in the slang of the camps as the crematoria ravens. And I guess I just ask you guys to think about, like, can we imagine how psychologically damaging being forced to do this work must have been. The Sonderkommando were separated from all other prisoners. They knew more than anybody else what the so-called final solution entailed. Are you giving me the 10? The what? The two? Really? <laughs> I 
thought this thing was over at 945. Yes? What's that? 945, so 15 minutes, right? Okay, you're just trying to give me a little heart attack up here. Okay. Um, they steal my they steal my text, they, they get my time wrong, and just making it really hard for me. Okay. Um, so the Sonder Commandos, they're separated from everybody else, right? Because they know what's going on, the real deal, right? They are given better rash, rations, they have more to eat, and their conditions are a little bit better. Um, they're also, they're, not only are they being do, forced to do this damaging work, but they are like, they know that their days are numbered, because about every six weeks or so, the Nazis would murder everyone in the Sonder Commando, and they would get a new bunch of guys in, right? They just knew too much. But though I'm telling you about this, this situation because because they're, they're, they were in a slightly better physical condition, they had possibilities, they were in a better position to resist. And in October 1944, for example, one of the Sonder Commandos at Birkenau managed to blow up one of the crematoria. Some, some explosives were smuggled in through, uh, from the outside through the Polish resistance. In the ensuing panic, a handful managed to escape. Three SS men were killed, ten injured. There were similar uprisings at Treblinka and at Sobibor. And of course, these things didn't actually really eventuate into anything, and there was terrible retribution that the Nazis enacted, right? But there was resistance, and there was violent resistance of this kind. There was also, and I think this is a, just as important, nonviolent resistance. The Sonderkommandos tried to document Nazi crimes. So in September 40, 1944, four photographs were smuggled out of Birkenau. A camera had been smuggled into the camp, and they were able to take four photographs um, of, uh, they're the most direct images we have of what the final solution entailed. So I'm going to show you these photographs now. The camera was like hidden in a bucket, and they had like not a lot of time to try to do this. Of course, super secret operation, very dangerous, right? First image you're going to see is not going to look like much of anything because they were not able to get the, to, to focus the image the way they wanted to, right? Um, so in summer of 44, Auschwitz-Birkenau is like overrun. All the Jews of Hungary have been sent there, and the gas chambers are, crematoria are operating at full capacity. You're going to see a group of, of Hungarian uh, Jewish uh, prisoners, and they have been stripped naked. They're kind of in this little forest, and they're, a bit be, they're forced uh, to run into the gas chamber. So this is this first photograph that I told you about, right? You see kind of these trees at the, at the top here, but it's hard to tell what else is happening here, so this one didn't quite work out. This is the second image. Again, it's very, the angle is very skewed, very canted, right? Which gives us kind of this very dramatic sort of effect. But you can see here in the bottom corner, I'm going to show you then in a second a detail of what, is, uh, of what the cor corner shows here, right? This is what I was just talking about here, these female prisoners who are being uh, about to be forced into the gas chamber. And then two images of the work that the Sonder Commando had to do afterwards, right? So they're dragging the corpses here and, and creating a, a mass pyre. There was so much destruction going on in the summer of 44 that the, the crematory themselves couldn't handle everything. So there's one image here, a second here, very iconic image. It's often kind of like blown up so that you see something like this. I'm showing you these pictures in part because, you know, I haven't shown any other images of Auschwitz-Birkenau, right? And you might be familiar with some of them, like what was going on at the ramp uh, uh, in the summer of 1944 where there's lots of the photos here uh, of those things, of selection of the Hungarian prisoners. But all those photos are taken by the SS, right? They're taken by the perpetrators. And they're important for us because they give us some kind of documentary evidence, right? But these were photographs that were basically taken for propaganda purposes, right? So we really need to think about what it means for us to look at those photos. It's not just like, here is straightforwardly document the, what happens, right? Those are photos that had an agenda. The photos we saw of the Sonder Commandos in the Ukraine, the photos we saw from the ghetto, similarly, taken by the perpetrators, right? These four photographs are the only ones that we have that are from the victims themselves, right? And I'm not saying we should never look at, at photographs taken by perpetrators, but we need to think about what it entails and the way that that potentially makes us complicit to some degree, right? So there's an important distinction between these four photographs and the other ones. You sometimes hear people say that Jews went like lambs to the slaughter. They didn't resist. And so I've just told you that that's like totally BS, right? That's wrong, okay? There was resistance. The Sonder Commando's action is particularly heroic, I think. Uh, the resistance was typically futile, and sometimes it was imagined more than anything else, but there was always resistance even in the darkest times, and I think that's really something we need to, to remember. I'm going to ask you guys another question about numbers. How many killing sites were there? And when I ask that question, I'm talking about ghettos, slave labor camps, 
concentration camps, killing factories, ravines in the woods where people were, were shot. If we think about all that number, what's your guess for how many of those places there were? 253, very precise. We feel good about that? What's the other number? I still can't hear, sorry. 10,000, okay, 10,253, I'll give them to take one more. 2,500, okay, 42,000, almost 43,000. Okay, so a huge number, right? And the point of me telling you that is that like, it's really impossible to believe when people were saying, well, we just had no idea this was going on, this was happening somewhere else, but it was happening all over the place, okay? It's easy to think that once liberation arrived, whether that came from the East, from the Soviets, whether it came from the West, from the British and the Americans, right? Once liberation arrived, once the, uh, those people who were still alive at the, in, in early 1945 in the, in the camps, that the Holocaust was over, that people went home, everything went back to normal, it was all good. But as the writer, chemist, Holocaust survivor Primo Levi said, in the majority of cases, the hour of liberation was neither joyful nor lighthearted. The people who were lucky enough to have survived were usually sick, they were weak, their families and loved ones were either dead or dispersed, their homes were destroyed or requisitioned, that means like someone else was living in them. Most people had no place to go. They found themselves living in what were called displaced persons camps, DP camps. Some of those camps were like basically the former concentration camps that just got kind of like switched over, right, into a different kind of, kind of uh, um, of camp, right? And people lived in these DP camps for years sometimes. They're searching for relatives, they're waiting for visas to be able to go somewhere else. The last of those camps closed only in 1950. So I'm telling you this here now as we're moving towards the conclusion to think about the ongoing nature of the Holocaust, right? Like it's not like just 19, oh, 1945, okay, it's done. Oof, that was lousy, but now we can move on and start over. That was not the case. The lives of survivors were marked indelibly by their experiences. Some suffered depression, anxiety, even shame at the thought that they had survived when so many others did not. But they also rebuilt their lives, they pursued education, they started careers, they started families. They weren't broken for life. But life would never be the same for them. And many unwillingly, unknowingly kind of passed this trauma on to their children. So again, it's an event that has a long repercussions, okay, to this day. And now's the end of the talk where I want to talk about us. All right? From the time the war was over, people wondered how something like the Holocaust could happen. And we're here to think about this today, right? It was not the first genocide. It was not the last, right? We talk a lot about this idea about like never again, this should never happen again. That totally has not stopped similar suffering from going, it's going on as we speak now, okay? And the Holocaust is definitely pretty overwhelming to think about, as is imagining how we could stop genocide. So what I want to end by today is by thinking about some conclusions that a philosopher, a guy named Theodore Adorno, came to in the years after the war. Adorno was this thinker, this guy who was part Jewish. He, he had to flee Germany in the 1930s. He went to the U.S. He spent the war years in California. But after the war, he went back to Germany, which was actually fairly unusual. And he's really obsessed with trying to think about, like, what would make people fascist? Could we figure out what might incline people to thinking and acting in ways that made violence and terror acceptable? So one of the things that Dorner realized was that certain social conditions lead to fascism. And he observed how fascism demands that we be tough with ourselves. Because that then licenses us, that makes us feel okay about being tough with other people. The language of National Socialism was full of these invocations of being hard, of being tough, and how that would be honorable and glorious. For example, the head of the SS, Himmler, in a secret speech to the SS, he, sa he famously says, most of you will know what it means when a hundred bodies lie together, when 500 are there, or when there are a thousand. And to have seen this through, and with the exception of human weakness, hmm, to have remained decent has made us hard and is a page of glory never mentioned and never to be mentioned, right? So this invocation of toughness connected to glory that you see here, right? And okay, so this is the head of the SS talking to SS officers and we're like, well, that has nothing to do with us. But I wanna suggest that it does, right? If you think about your own lives, I bet that you will find similar demands to be tough, to be strong, not to be weak, to push yourself through obstacles, 
There's a lot of very gendered languages in this regard, like to man up, to grow a pair, or something like this. Like you may have heard people say things like this to you, right? Maybe you've heard them from your teachers, maybe you've heard them from your coaches, maybe from your parents, from your friends, from yourself. Does this resonate, this idea of you've got to be tough, you've got to be to, to make it? The only way that we can combat fascism, Adorno suggested, is to admit to our weakness, to admit to all the anxiety that our current reality demands. There's like a lot to be anxious about. That was true then and this is true now. It's a lot harder but a lot more important to admit I am scared than to hide that emotion. Because that emotion, Adorno is saying, is going to come out in some form or other. And it's, if you don't express it in a good way, it's going to come out in a bad way. It's going to come out specifically by attacking someone who is weaker, less privileged than we are. This seems like an important place for me to say that it's really tempting for us to think about the perpetrators as like monsters, right? As demons as beasts, as sociopaths in some way, okay? The reason it's tempting is because we think that we aren't any of those things, right? So we give ourselves a kind of collective past. We're like, woof, some Germans did some crazy stuff back in the day. Good thing that we're not like that. Good thing we don't live there then, right? You should know that after the war, lots of Nazis, you know, they're the ones who, who, are, who are, don't kill themselves or aren't died or dead or whatever, Many of them are arrested, and they get subjected to this psychological testing, right? The Allies put them under this battery of, psych of, of psych uh, psychological tests. And invariably, they come across as sane or normal. Like, they don't all flunk the test. They're not all pr proven to be sociopaths, right? Point I'm making is that there's no necessary difference between us and between someone who did something terrible. To do terrible things is part of what it means to be a human being. That's the bad news, right? It doesn't mean we have to do those things, okay? And I think if we can, like, admit that we're scared and that we're vulnerable, this is the precondition for true resilience, which I think we want in ourselves and for our loved ones. It's also the precondition for actually learning something, for letting ourselves learn something. To learn something, you have to let yourself be vulnerable, okay? For the rest of the day, you're going to have the privilege of learning things. So I encourage you to be vulnerable, to be open, to be resilient. Before long, we won't have any living links to the Holocaust. We're really fortunate that we have one here today. We're going to hear from her later on. But that means that it's going to be up to us to be vulnerable enough to realize that the lessons of the Holocaust are still lessons for us all. So let's go learn some stuff today. Thanks very much. <laughs>